Welcome to Forward with NACI, Inspiring Entrepreneurial Action, a podcast that shares the stories of everyday entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial leaders, and the communities that support us. We hope that this diverse collection of stories brings you inspiration, inspires you to take action, and ignites entrepreneurship in your community as we make our way forward together. Welcome to this episode of Forward with NACI. I'm really happy to be joined today with Courtney Tellefson. She is the CEO and founder of The Produce Box. So, Courtney, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. So, I had a chance to visit you at your amazing warehouse and experience what The Produce Box is today, but it started with an idea. And so, maybe you could just introduce yourself, tell a little bit about your background, and maybe what led um, to you creating this this new business that really met um, a need and, and sparked, I think, career opportunities for so many people. Yes. Yeah, so, this was back in 2008. Now, 2008, there were, at the time, no delivery services, no subscription services, nothing like that. Um, I had worked in the gym business for 10 years. So, you know, in that business back then and even now is membership-based and subscription. You pay a monthly fee because why wouldn't you exercise every month? (laughs) Uh, And so I was in that business. I got out of it. I was a stay-at-home mom, and I heard about this program called CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. And so I called my friend Eva and I said, Eva, there's this guy, his name's Fred, you know, he's, he's in a band and he needs support. He's a local farmer and, you know, we pay $600 and you get a share in his farm and it's going to be awesome. And it's 600 bucks. Let's split it. And she said, okay. And so we did it. And so a hundred of us paid $600 for a share in Fred's farm. Uh, and so the next summer we all would, you know, get our stuff together and go meet in this parking lot in our town and, you know, sort of get in line and pat each other on the back because we were supporting local farmers <laughs> and, you know, every, everything was great to start. Uh, and then as tomato crop failed, uh, I think we got a few strawberries. We got a lot of daikon radish. So we're Googling how to use daikon radish. <laughs> uh, then swim team started. Couldn't make it to a couple of the pickups, vacations. And then at that point, Eve and I are negotiating on who's going to go pick it up, you know. And so at the end of the summer, you know, you just you think about, was it worth it? And for me, I could not get myself organized, for God's sake, to go to that parking lot. And I thought, you know, if you could deliver it, that would be so much better. And so that next summer, I sent an email out to 250 families in our neighborhood and our Yahoo group back then and said, if I could figure this out, would you be interested? Because the question is, do you figure it out first and then find your customers? So you did right? what a lot of people f- fail to do, quite honestly, is you did that customer discovery. And right. even really seasoned entrepreneurs, we deal with this sometimes, people that are you know, have these complex, um, you know, things they've invented or developed, but they've never taken the time to see would somebody actually pay for that. So, so continue, tell us what happened in this customer discovery process. So I asked first, uh, and 25 people responded and said, yeah, if you could figure it out, then do it. So then I had to figure it out. I had two weeks because I told them I would start in two weeks. And so I set myself a deadline. I went to the farmer's market, talked to a few farmers, and ended up working with one farmer. They would build a box for me, and then I added to that cost. So he charged me 14 and I completely made it up. I did no financial planning whatsoever because <laughs> I didn't really have any cost, and I added $4 to it. So I charged $22, and I would drive around my neighborhood. I put my kids in the back of the car, grab the boxes from the farmer's market, and then deliver to these 25 families. And uh, that first year um, went well. I had some moms who were picking up from my house because I didn't want to go to their neighborhoods because it was a whole 10 miles away. Mm -hmm. And uh, then those moms started picking up for their friends. And that's when I figured out that this might be a business. And I said to those ladies, I said, you know, I could pay you to deliver. And they said, well, what would you pay me? And I said, well, um, again. Made it up. Made it up. I said, (laughs) how about this? And they said, "Uh, okay. And that's how it started. So that first year I grew from 25 to 200. Second year uh, to 1,000. 
third year, 3,000, 4,000, and now we have 8,000 members. We have 150 mostly stay-at-home moms who deliver in the neighborhoods that they live in. So their um, footprint's very small. The wear and tear on their car is small. Gas is small. They deliver in those neighborhoods, and uh, we're delivering across the state of North Carolina. That is, that's amazing. And I, I want to get into... Um, you may be telling us how you made it through the pandemic. When, when I visited you and I saw everybody in that warehouse um, and you kind of explained to me how in the midst of a pandemic, you, you not only kept things moving, but you grew tremendously. So, so talk to us about how you thought about how to um, keep the business not only going, but growing. And then you had to make some pivots along the way. Yes. So I was already in a different mindset in in March of 2020. So in January of 2020, uh, my business was declining. I had, a, I had gone from a high of 6,000 orders back, you know, before all of these other things were happening, and I uh, had declined to about 2,900 boxes. I was pretty worried. That's about break even for us. Uh, and so I sort of <clears throat> corralled our executive team and said, okay, what are we going to do? If we keep doing what we've been doing, we're going to keep getting what we've been getting, which is decline. Mm -hmm. And so we listed our assets. I have a coach, and he said, think about what your assets are. And so we listed out our assets. Okay, we're good at packing. We have all of these moms who can deliver. We have this great dis distribution system that's in expensive we have nine trucks we have refrigeration we have refrigerator we have uh, relationships with all these 50 farmers and we listed all our assets and we started thinking about how could we use those assets could we distribute for other people could we uh, pr do prepared meals could we distribute other things you know how can we use all these assets and so we were already thinking creatively you know mm -hmm. and then the pandemic hit and it went bananas. So we were on a 5,000 person wait list within two weeks of March 24th. And um, we cleared that within two weeks. It was pretty much all hands on deck. We had two trucks going to each um, party stop, we call them, where the moms gather and then go back to their neighborhoods. Party stop, I love yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so we had two trucks going to the party stops. We, in, we uh, hired a bunch of more people. Um, because a lot of people were out of work at the time. We had a lot of stay-at-home dads at the time, stay-at-home dads who we hired, a lot of college kids. Um, it was crazy, but we survived it. We ramped up to probably eight or 9,000 regular orders. And then the North Carolina Baptist Men and Baptist Men on Mission reached out to us. The North Carolina Department of Ag had heard about things we were doing. They needed help distributing boxes, and they recommended us. And so we packed 75,000 boxes for Baptist Men on Mission, who distributed them out to low-income families across the state. But if I hadn't already been thinking creatively back in January and sort of started to get the word out about things that we could do mm -hmm. other than what we were doing— I don't know that I would have ever gotten that opportunity with the Baptist men. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's kind of that 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 networking, but really getting your story out here. And mm -hmm. as you arrived in the studio today, I know you were chatting with um, one of our producers about all these great videos of stories that you're going to get out uh, mm -hmm. there, but you had just have so many to tell and, and mm -hmm. just curating them and trying to figure out how to get your message out because there's so much noise out there and, and things that people can be distracted upon. But I want to get into um, one thing that I experienced when I saw your, um, your warehouse that people that are listening could maybe imagine but first of all it was so clean and the people were just so happy not that I would think it wasn't clean but it was a very cheerful kind of environment and there mm -hmm. were just beautiful you know just I remember those conquered grapes they were enormous so talk talk about how do you keep your your employees kind of really loving their jobs and, and working together as a team I, I know all of us as managers sometimes struggle with that yeah so that is a story let me tell you so um, I had a partner years ago um, who, okay, so let's start, first of all, let's start with cleanliness. So he instituted all of that. I mean, we have one of those, I call it a Zamboni, but it's a, a mop that you drive you know, you stand behind it and you drive it. And I remember at the time I was like, why are we mopping a concrete warehouse floor? <laughs> but he was right. Yeah. And so that he started all of that. Um, but, you know, it's a partner thing, you know, and over seven or eight years, we had divergent opinions about how to 
about company culture and how to communicate with employees. And he was very direct and very clear and concise. And uh, I was, I had a different opinion. And for a long time, the admin, my area and his area were kind of separate, you know, and it got to the point where, you know, sometimes he would say, don't, you don't need to go out in the warehouse. I mean, they, they, they don't, they, you make them nervous, you know, you don't need to go out there, da, 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 da. And I was like, wow, gosh, am I doing that? Am I making these guys nervous? Mm-hmm. And I believed him for a long time. Yeah. And so, you know, we parted ways. I ended up buying him out. You know, there was a trigger event that sort of ended everything. And it took me three years to get the culture different. Yeah. Um, and it started with no cussing out there. I remember, gosh, y'all, I remember um, <laughs> I, I brought everybody into the break room because I'd heard some complaints because ladies would come into the warehouse, some of these ladies who deliver, and they would hear cussing. And I brought every single one of those guys. It was a lot of guys at the time. I said, let me tell you, I, I want to be as clear as I can possibly can if I hear you cuss one more time you're fired I'm not going to have it this is my company and I'm not going to have that kind of language and everybody was really quiet and it never happened again but you know it was a a a lot of it was about what do I want yeah my company to be like do you know what I'm saying I I do and and I think you know I'm more about the we and and not everyone is oriented like that some mm-hmm. people are more about the me and the mine this is my piece of it this is right and it's hard when you're the ceo i'm the ceo of an organization and you have some of those sort of cultural differences and, that's right and i think it's funny to hear you talk because i think you kind of leaned into your mom persona <laughs> it's- <laughs> and it worked right yes yeah. because, you know it's embracing the leadership style that you have that is clearly very effective and and i the other thing i i noticed about you when we were talking a bit about finances um, on our visit is that you have a very good mind for numbers in in a way that makes sense to you as the leader and also to me because that's how I think about things too you know what your break even is right you know and you also know probably to the the dollar what your payroll is that's the thing that keeps me going Mm because I know every single month you know and I have a very good vice president of finance but I know you know this is our payroll we're not getting government support and we're going to do that so I think I think that's really powerful and I would encourage people um, to really think about that and embrace your leadership style and a partnership has to work if people can come together and, and make it work. Now, one thing I saw in your office that was cool was on your wall, just to give people a sense, you had all of these phrases and quotes and sayings um, there, but maybe share just a little bit of maybe some of the things that you do with that wall. Does that does that inspire yeah. you when you're feeling a little stuck? Or Yeah, so uh, it's almost the entire wall now, and literally it's just printed out in different fonts. <laughs> you know, just lessons that I've learned over the last 10 years and literally Literally, it's, you know, construction paper, colored construction paper, and then the quote on the front. Uh, And it started with the very first lesson was right, not rushed. That was the very first one I did like 10 years ago. And that was, again, this culture thing where it's like, are we going to save payroll by asking people to pack boxes as quickly as possible? you know, and, and try to get it done fast, or is it going to be right? Because we were making mistakes, you know? And so that was the first one, right, not rushed, right, not rushed, right, not rushed. And the last one, one of the last ones that we've put up, and this is from maybe a year ago, was what's the right thing to do? Mm. Um, And that is how I run my business. So, you know, when we're all, when we have a hard question, that we have to answer in the executive team. We're all in my office and somebody says what's going on and we all kind of look at each other and and I go, well, what's the right thing to do? And let's just say it's an, it's an employee. Let me give you an example. An employee wants a, um, incre- a um, loan on his paycheck and we've never done it before and he wants $300. And so we're all sitting there, right? And then I go, okay, well, what's the right thing to do? Because, you know, the CFO wants to, that's not a good idea. You know, do you don't want to set a precedent? Yeah, la, la, la. What right. if you don't get your money back? All this other stuff, right? And I said, well, what's the right thing to do? And we all kind of stared at each other for a minute. And then somebody said, well, the right thing to do is to give him the loan. And we did. Yeah. And we've been doing it for 18 months. I just did it for a guy four weeks ago. We hired him. Uh, he left us. He came back. We rehired him. He'd gone, been gone about three years, and he needed a loan. 
And so I said, yes, it's not like an official thing, but he came to me. He needed $500. I said, yes. Now we've done it about 10 times. He quit a week later. So I lost the $500, yeah. you know, and, and my CFO said, now see, that's why I don't want to do this. But I still believe it was the right thing to do. Right. That's on him that he doesn't pay it back. It's not on me. Do you know what I mean? I'm well, going to do the right thing. And it's a long game too, right? Mm-hmm. You don't know. You don't know. He may very well come back to you he in, might. in a year. I've seen that before too. And I think that's where when I hear what your philosophy is, you know, that's a small bet, right? You're mm-hmm. a multi-million dollar company. It's right. 500 bucks. Right. You know? Yeah. And, and it's a good lesson. So I would love for you to share, Courtney, how people could find out about the produce box if they want to become a member or just learn more about your story. How do they find you? Yes. So our website is the, T-H-E, produceboxcom We This particular operation is only in North Carolina. However, we have sister companies all across the country. So if you, if you go to theproducebox.com and you don't live in North Carolina, we are happy to recommend you to other companies pretty much in almost every state. There's a company, Philly Food Works in Philadelphia. There's Farmhouse oh, Delivery nice. in Texas. There's places everywhere. So if you want to go to theproducebox.com and click contact or get in the chat, we'll recommend you to someone in another state and even in other countries. Now tell us too, uh, you know, if there are stay-at-home moms or dads or college students and so forth, are you continuing to hire people in the in the Raleigh or greater North Carolina area? Uh, we don't have many openings, honestly. Uh, we have 150 uh, positions and we have two open right now oh, wow. because okay. these guys are averaging with tips $30 an hour. And there just is no job where you can work four hours a week you know, delivering, make $30 an hour and take your kids. So it's a very coveted position. We are looking to duplicate in other states. Um, So if there's a excited um, mom or woman or or guy out there that's interested in um, potentially looking to duplicate, we certainly can talk to them about that. Have have you explored a a franchise um, model? We have nope. a contact for you. <laughs> One of our previous guests uh, is actually an amazing guy. Lives in North Carolina, relocated mm-hmm. from uh, California, and is is raising his grandchildren, ch- uh, I mm. believe. Mm-hmm. And amazing guy. So I'll put you in touch, Steve Wright. So hopefully, some okay. of our listeners have have listened to Steve Wright. He represents over, I think, 150 franchises. So, awesome. well, this has been a great conversation, Courtney. I'm really excited about the work that you're doing. Thank I think you. Not only in terms of from a business standpoint, but really a, a life standpoint. I mm-hmm. mean, people don't think about that. I mean, mm-hmm. I've had two kids. One of my kids was very sick and had a lot of issues. And I, I think back on, I had to grapple with like, what was I going to do? You know, if I taught, then I'd have to hire a babysitter and like, you know, then what? So I just, I think there's so many cool things that are going to happen with this. So I thank you for sharing thank your you. story. And I thank all of our listeners around the world for joining us and make it a great day. This was fun. Thank you.